I'm Magalie Laguerre-Wilkinson, a reporter for CUNY TV and CBS This Morning, and producer at 60 Minutes. Today, I have the rare privilege of interviewing Jeff Fager, the chairman of CBS News and executive producer of 60 Minutes, about the news magazine that sets the gold standard in broadcast journalism. Originating in 1968, 60 Minutes has won more awards and accolades than any show in television history and it's also America's most watched news broadcast, regularly making Nielsen's top 10. It looks deceptively simple. Interviews and B-roll footage are interwoven with voiceover narration to create a story that results in hard-hitting investigative reports, feature segments, and profiles of people in the news. Sounds easy, yet those who've tried to replicate it find it to be quite the challenge. So tonight, Jeff Fager will give us insight into what it takes to make this legendary show, well, tick. Then we'll round out the program by presenting student versions of 60 Minutes, produced by the Brooklyn College Graduate School of Television and Radio. But first, Jeff Fager. 60 Minutes looks easy. It's, it's <laughs> tell me a story, yeah. as the old saying went uh, from Don Hewitt. Is it? We try to make it look easy. Because at the end of the day, you want the viewer to just have a completely understandable story. Yes, it is a simple concept, and we try to keep it simple, and we want the viewer to see it as a simple story, not told in a complicated way, but in, in an easy way to follow. And uh, so it's nice that people think it's easy, but others who try to get into our line of work find it a little tougher than, than Speaking that. of which, for the people who do want to get into that line of work, what does it take to put a 60-minute story together? Well, I mean by that that the other networks who have tried to duplicate 60 Minutes have done it, you know, at their peril in some cases and have found it hard to do. A lot of people who have tried to imitate it have added bells and whistles, lights and graphics and things, and yet mm -hmm. it seems as though at 60 Minutes it's still the tight shot, the mm -hmm. face. You're, you're, you're taken in by the subject. Is that an art? Yes, I think it's a, that is a huge part of Don Hewitt's creation which is what we believe in to this day strongly, that it's not about bells and whistles, it is about telling a story. Is the art behind also the writing to make a subject that someone, if you told them about it randomly, they might not be taken by it? It doesn't make a headline, but yet it's a good story. No, I think that's a great point because uh, one of the things that challenges us the most and that we're proudest of is when we do a story at 60 Minutes that most television, most broadcast news organizations wouldn't touch our challenge is to take every story, particularly important ones, and make them interesting. So if my favorite things to hear is, I never thought I was going to be mm. interested in that. But I watched how you folks told it, and it sucked me in, and I watched the whole thing, and I got something out of it. So this is for an academic audience that we're doing this. Speak to this point. Does 60 Minutes educate America, too, in a way? Well, I think that's part of what we're supposed to be doing. I mean, as reporters, I think that's what drives us into it. And I think it's a little highfalutin to say we educate America. But to the people who are the viewers of 60 Minutes walk away with a better understanding of a story, yes. And I think that's the most important goal. We do still think of it as a public service, that we cover important stories and we give people a better understanding of them. Is there a formula? There's not a formula. You know, there are certain rules about 60 minutes and storytelling that we abide by, but they're not formulaic as much as they are. We avoid uh, traditional or typical news uh, speak. For example, give right. us an example. Well, <laughs> uh, I, you know, I have a board in my office that um, is of the words that we don't want to use, and they almost never show up in the screening <laughs> because yes. most people know news speak is not what we want. And for instance, the word clear is the most overused word in news. Nothing in the world is really that clear that we cover. If it was, it, there wouldn't be a story there. Right. It, it, everything is a little bit subtle, and it always scares me because the mindset of a reporter who thinks something is clear and they know it well enough is someone who's likely to have their mind made up about a story before they go shoot it, which is, I think, the biggest hazard in journalism. But I also don't believe that um, they say it because they believe anything's clear. They say it because it sounds like a news story. In fact, it doesn't. In fact, is another one I hate. <laughs> it doesn't, you know, it's a, you hear it all of the time. And so we do try to avoid that news speak. Tell me, 
Stephanie Polevsky, for example, and, and other staffers at 60 Minutes have taught classes in universities on, on TV news magazine and, and TV news magazine writing. Is there a benefit to students to taking courses like that, or is it just you learn in the field? Well, I think there's a benefit. Uh, I've, I've seen some of the work that Stephanie's students have done. I, I saw the Andrew Falzone piece about the Zeitgeist movement. The goal of the movement is to live in a world without money and to use technology to provide for basic human needs. I know him. He worked at 60 Minutes for a while. He's a, obviously a naturally talented broadcaster with some experience. So for a college piece, it, it was extraordinary. And I think it helps. I had some issues with it. Um, <laughs> but I think it helps to uh, be able to do that and to practice that. When kids ask me what's the skill I need the most, I tell them several things, but writing. And I think a lot of people don't, don't think of television as writing being important, but of course it's central. The storytelling part of what we do is central. So I love seeing an English major come apply for a job or a history major. You know, I think a liberal arts education is actually quite good for a journalist because an understanding of the world is, is really helpful and useful. And so, uh, you know, those things I think matter. I don't necessarily encourage or discourage someone from going into a journalism program because the thing about journalism that I love is that uh, there's no one way to do it. Everybody does it a little differently. And I envy the experience that those people are getting at Brooklyn College. You've sort of answered my next question, which is, do you have to go to J school for this? No, and, no. no, you don't. And I mean, that's, uh, I do, I, as I say, I envy them because I came up, I think, a harder way which was, uh, you know, doing some pretty uh, low-level jobs, uh, which I never minded. I, I, you know, I learned every step of the way. Mm -hmm. I think there are benefits to journalism school, and I think one of them is that you end up getting into this world at a higher level, um, and usually an editorial level. And it took me some time to get to that. But, uh, so there's, but I do feel strongly that there is not one way to do it. Well, um, well recently, Mike Wallace died. Tell me a little bit about his legacy and what will stay on at 60 Minutes that others should look up to. His legacy, uh, in terms of our broadcast, there's no doubt, and Don Hewitt would be the first to admit it, 60 Minutes would not have survived if it wasn't for the two of them, that Mike really brought so much that became our identity. I'm Mike Wallace. I think his I'm legacy Wallace. itself I'm is Wallace. 60 Minutes, and that's a powerful I'm legacy. I'm Mike Wallace. He was a remarkable man. and. You know, one of the things I loved about Mike is that uh, he had a great natural ability, but he worked it so hard. And he would get to know a story so well, and he'd be second-guessing himself and his producer to the point of driving the producer literally <laughs> yes. crazy, but all in the interest of doing the best interview he could. And that was one of the things about Mike Wallace. He was really courageous. Imam President Sadat of Egypt says that what you are doing now is, quote, a disgrace to Islam, and he calls you, Imam, forgive me, his words, not mine, a lunatic. He was a very strong guy, and, you know, when you sit down across from somebody to say to them, you know, the president of China, you know, Zhang Jimen, you, you are the dictator, you know, and what father says, father gets otherwise. If you get in the way of father, father will take care of you. He would challenge everybody. And uh, so, really, it became the Mike Wallace question, I think, became a huge part of 60 Minutes and our growth as a broadcast and becoming bigger uh, in the 70s into the 80s in terms of more prominent and a bigger audience. And I, I really do believe that people would tune in, regardless of what Mike Wallace was covering, just to hear what he would ask next. What the dickens are you doing? Who wants to kill you? It's almost an embarrassment, sir, to hear this from you. Me? Yes, you. His motivating factor, which I think is another part of his legacy, was to get to the truth. One way or another, Mike Wallace was going to get to the truth. So, to you a little bit, Jeff, mm -hmm. what was it like when you first came to 60 Minutes? You were a producer here, you worked with Steve Croft. You know, I love being at CBS News. To me, it was the ultimate. I'd come from KPIX in San Francisco. It was my last stop. I was in local news. And, and to get to the network, and, and this network in particular, I just couldn't believe it. I thought I had, I had to pinch myself. It was twice that when I got to 60 Minutes, because it was Don Hewitt and Mike Wallace and Morley Safer and Ed Bradley. 
And all these people that I so respected and the atmosphere up there was all about story. Mm -hmm. This is about journalism. And, and how? Tell, explain well, that atmosphere. Well, never any discussion which you find in TV newsrooms about ratings and about, uh, you know, what's going to, you know, what story is really going to um, pander to a certain audience. It didn't matter. It was what tell the story. was just great storytelling yeah. and great stories. And um, it was just, it's, it was at a high level, yet they were fun. Imagine being able to do both, high level and fun. Yeah, I mean, they didn't yeah. ever take yeah. themselves too seriously. Yeah. I mean, and that was important to me, too. I think there's a lot of self-importance in, in broadcast journalism, and they just never felt that way. I, I, you know, one of the things I love about Mike Wallace is he wasn't a prima donna at all. Go down. It bothered me in the movie, The Insider, that he came across as a prima donna, and I didn't think that was fair to him. Hmm. They were regular guys and great to be around and full of life and spirit and feisty and fighting with each other and everybody else around them. It was just a very exciting place to end up. I produced Steve Croft's first piece. So they were nervous about us. And I remember that screening room because Mike Wallace came in, which is unheard of. I mean, another correspondent comes into a screening that never happened. But uh, they were very pleased with it, so. And in a way, when you get to 60 Minutes, you're at the helm, you have to earn being there. Yes. You don't just arrive and, and that's it and you, you rest on your laurels. Explain yeah. that a little bit. Well, it's a funny um, uh, <laughs> quote that Bill Owens had, our executive editor in the New York Times. We don't have welcoming parties at 16 minutes. <laughs> <No. laughs> and it is a hard place. It should be a hard place. Um, you succeed based on the merit, period. If your work is good enough, it's going to work out. And if it isn't, you should go somewhere else. And everybody knows it's been that way. It's never been an easy place to succeed and it shouldn't be. Each reporter is an adult, and there isn't any supervision in terms of where you're going to go with your story, other than just the casual discussions we have about direction sure, and sure. approving your story, which is not an easy process either. Mm -hmm. And we expect that you're going to have not only the ability to go in the direction you think is right, but make good decisions. And so by the time, I think it's a scary prospect for a lot of people at 60 Minutes when it gets around to the screening process. Yes. <laughs> and, it should, and it should be. And it should be. Yeah. You mm -hmm. talked about approving the story. Tell us a little bit for the people who don't know, what draws you in? Because there are things that we'll write up and find and think, this is great. I see it. You envision it. Mm -hmm. But you didn't see it. Yeah. So what do you see? It's complicated. And it's an amazing process, really, because we try to add it up. I think overall, we probably get about 3,000 ideas that are serious submitted in a year and we do 100 stories a year. And so that's a lot of rejections. I sometimes joke I should have a stamp that says no <laughs> on it. But uh, the rule at 60 Minutes is we don't explain when we say no. Uh, because otherwise, we'd be spending all day explaining, no, we don't want to do this story. The rule is that if you have a problem, if you really want to do it, and you're unhappy with that it was rejected, you push hard and you get to do it. So it's never final. It's never final. And uh, if, if a team really feels strongly about a story, that says something about what it's going to be like at the end of the day when the story gets done. I love it when all three stories, whether they're a profile or a news story uh, or something in the middle of those two types, uh, all three stories are relevant in some way to our world today. To me, we're better off that way, and I, and I really do believe that uh, the viewer benefits that way. Now, that doesn't mean that, I mean, I'm a big fan of an adventure piece. You just did a beautiful adventure piece, one of our favorites of the year, on the symphony orchestra in Kinshasa. We're going to take you places you never imagined and show you things. The adventure piece is a huge part of what we do. Uh, and is sometimes less relevant, great. It just takes you away. It takes you away. That's the thing. But I do like to think that we're relevant and also that we have a nice mix. You know, we don't want to do a lot of celebrity pieces, for instance. I mean, we do a handful that we think are, are worth it because they're important and interesting figures. And, and, and they're, they're in the now. And they're yeah. worthy of it. Mm -hmm. don't, don't tell me all of them, but what are some of your favorite segments of 60 Minutes? Probably Abu Ghraib which Don Hewitt died saying was, he thinks, the best story we ever put on. Americans did this to an Iraqi prisoner. According to the U.S. Army, the man was told to stand on a box with his head covered. He was told that if he fell off the box, he would be electrocuted. The ones you're proudest of are the ones that have the most impact. 
I think of a story that Steve Croft did with Ira Rosen this year that you know got congressional sure. action right away on insider trading in Congress. Do you think it's all right for uh, a speaker uh, to accept uh, a very preferential and favorable uh, stock deal? Well, we didn't. It, you know, that's the kind of thing that makes a mark. Uh, so I, I think that that is what drives us the most is you know, doing something that really is news. Back to the point about Bill Owen saying there are no welcoming parties at 60 Minutes. This is sort of keeping up with the Don Hewitt tradition. You uh, arrived at the helm of 60 Minutes in 2004. What else have you kept that, that's been around since 1968? And what's a little bit of the Jeff Fager that you brought to the show? If I had to say one thing, it, it is this business of being more relevant. You know, I, I never liked it when we had too many stories done before the season started because most of those would be evergreens that could run any time of the year. And to me, that's less interesting. On the other hand, I really felt strongly that uh, I not be in a place where I wanted to put my mark on this great broadcast that so many people had poured themselves into. So I really uh, was a, a student of Don's and Mike's and everybody else's, Ed's and Morley's. I mean, I worked closely with Morley. I, I learned more from Steve Croft, I think, than almost any other correspondent I, I worked with. I just felt very strongly that it was my responsibility to, uh, you know, keep this broadcast as significant as it had been. That's a lot of responsibility. It is. And I think appreciating how the storytelling is at a certain level. Uh, that it was always such a, you know, a, an interesting and hard collaboration, which is another very important part of the place, that we're collaborating. We work together in concert. Sometimes we get into fights about it, but it's never personal. It's always about making the story better. And you talk about this collaboration. I mean, what's, what's really interesting at 60 Minutes is really this, this collaboration and camaraderie, in a way, with the producers and the, the correspondents, because in a way, the producer will do a lot of the legwork sometimes, but at the end of the day, the correspondent carries it. I mean, it's their job to tell that story. Explain a little bit about that relationship. I, I think it's, it's a little too much to say the correspondent carries it because each team's a little bit different. Each person on each team brings something unique. So Ed Bradley always had great interviewing skills, as did Mike Wallace. Morley Safer was a good interviewer, but he was a great writer. I think Steve Croft is the most pure reporter and probably the most thorough reporter and writer that we've had. Scott Pelley, who has had more experience on the road covering stories than just about any peer. And Leslie Stahl, you know, terrific interviewer and amazing presence and also a really good reporter. They each bring something a little bit unique and are such strong personalities, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, Laura Logan, who is our youngest correspondent, more war experience than practically anybody's ever worked at CBS News. Well, you're obviously the executive producer of 60 Minutes and the chairman of CBS News. What's the hardest part of your job now? I mean, this is not a small well, job. No, but so here's the best part of that is I work with incredibly talented people. David Rhodes is the president of CBS News. I got to hire him. He's amazing. And Bill Owens, who's the number two, the executive editor at 60 Minutes. Those are two of the smartest people there are, not to mention all the correspondents at, at 60 Minutes who are like senior producers of their units. I mean, they are. We always call them co-editors because they are. They run their units and they're very good at it. So, um, but uh, a reporter asked me uh, about a year ago when I took the job as chairman of CBS News, what, you know, you had the dream job, executive producer of, <laughs> of uh, 60 Minutes. Um, now you have all these headaches. and. I pointed to David Rhodes, no, he has the headaches. <laughs> I still have the dream job. But you know, it was a really important responsibility that uh, Les Moonves would choose me to do this. And I, I think a compliment to everybody who works at 60 Minutes. So for people who watch on Sunday nights and say, wow, I'd love to work there one day, mm -hmm. or who are in J school or in college right now, what, what's the message? The message is there are jobs. People would be surprised how young 60 Minutes is. It's a place where really good reporting at an early age is respected and like every other position, I like to think it's about merit. Nobody shows up there because they know somebody. They get a job and, and because they're highly recommended or, you know, we don't really have a lot of entry level. Uh, sometimes we do. But I just say to kids all the time, just get your foot in the door somewhere and start working on a news 
broadcast. Uh, if it's television you're interested, or a newspaper, because we hire people from newspapers to come to 60 Minutes, and they tend to be a uh, really great uh, part of our broadcast. We have lawyers at 60 Minutes. You know, it's an amazing mix of people who are, but all dedicated to reporting. One of the things that we changed when I took over was to put everybody, everybody has an ambition to be reporting who works there. The people who answer the phones, the people who help producers with logistics, they're also working on stories. Sure, sure. And some of them are 23 and 24 years old. So I think our place is an inspiration for young journalists, young people who really want to get into uh, this line of work. And now, the Brooklyn College Special Edition of 60 Minutes. This shadowy preacher wants to see the dollar die. He's a member of a self-described social activist group known as the Zeitgeist Movement. The group has chapters in all 50 states and 49 countries around the world. We've been told that there are upwards of 500,000 people possibly following the movement. Where does that fit in in terms of the size of other movements? Well, if that's true, then it is definitely the largest movement in history. I'm not sure, though, that it's true. I've seen people who have had such severe seizures that they've had to wear helmets every day, that they cannot take them off. I've met other people that have about 120 seizures a day, and really, you cannot talk to them. Tim Dejao is 24 years old. He has been suffering from epilepsy since he was diagnosed at age 10. I had never thought, okay, medical marijuana, that's what I want. But I was ready to try something else. I had never done drugs, but I figured, okay, maybe it'll help. Times Square is a dazzling neon tourist magnet, and it's easy to see why. Just take a quick stroll down Broadway. The flashing, glittering signs on every corner mean Times Square is bright as day, even at midnight. Tourism has become one of the anchors of New York's economy. The city loves tourists to come, but it's like the old New Yorker cartoon, you know, welcome New York, now get the hell out. I'm Nate Bellotto. I'm Christina San Inocencio. I'm Fleming Larson. I'm Laura Alex. I'm Andrew Falzone. I'm Steve Dispenza. Those stories tonight on the special Brooklyn College edition of 60 Minutes. Zeitgeist. It's a word you may have heard before. Its origins are German, and if you've ever used it in a sentence, you know it refers to the spirit of the age. What you may not know is that it's also the name of a worldwide social movement spawned from a trilogy of documentary films released on the internet. The goal of the movement is to live in a world without money and to use technology to provide for basic human needs. While their membership is explicitly nonviolent, some of their ideas in their movies might make you uncomfortable. One claims that Jesus never really existed and that 9-11 was an inside job. While they admit they don't have all the answers, they're always trying to spread the word to see if they can seduce you into becoming a member of the Zeitgeist Movement. Union Square around 10 a.m. There's a masked man pacing through the park with one thing on his mind. He's hell-bent on murder. Not you, not me. This shadowy preacher wants to see the dollar die, and he wants to tell you all about it. He calls himself Mr. Kill Money, and he's no solitary stalker. He's a member of a self-described social activist group known as the Zeitgeist Movement. A little bit of old-fashioned pavement pounding. Get your free DVD and information right here, folks. Mixed with a little bit of sidewalk evangelism is just one of the Zeitgeist recruitment techniques. We wanted to meet some of the estimated half million worldwide Zeitgeisters, and we started with their New York City chapter. Three of their more active members sat down to give us some insight into the movement. What continually motivates you to give your time, your resources, your energy to be a part of this movement. You have to do something. If you do nothing, nothing will change. You know, one of our favorite mantras to practice is, be the change that you want to see in the world. Yeah, the question for me is, why aren't, why aren't other people spending more time <laughs> on, more, on, on, on issues exactly. like this, you know? While the group spends their Sundays in the park, it's actually not their most effective recruitment tool. Putting their message online is what's transformed them into a global phenomenon. Would-be followers can visit their website and download three films that bear the group's name for free. 
The films are the work of Peter Joseph. The musician and filmmaker debuted a performance art piece in Brooklyn in 2007. Some of the video projections that played behind him formed the basis of the first film, a self-financed documentary he called Zeitgeist the Movie. He was not available to speak with us in person, but in this 2010 interview, he details the movement's earliest days. But since the internet is what it is, tossed it up online to see what would happen. Maybe some people would like it, they download it, I get some feedback, whatever. What happened completely blew my mind. According to Joseph, popularity of the movie grew far quicker than he anticipated, and it's not hard to see why. The film is based on three very provocative claims. The first is that Jesus Christ never really existed. The movie says Christ is merely a Christian parable with many similarities to other religions. The character of Jesus being a literary and astrological hybrid is most explicitly a plagiarization of the Egyptian sun god Horus. If religion doesn't grab your attention, perhaps the movie's claim about 9-11 will, with clips from that day played over and over again. The film alleges that 9-11 was a conspiracy theory conceived by a cartel of global power brokers who created an unwinnable war on terrorism, and it uses clips like this to try to convince its audience. Of course we're after Saddam Hussein, I mean, uh, Bin Laden. This is an attempt to prevent the American people from knowing the facts about how we could have prevented 9-11, and people are covering it up today. The final claim put forward in the movie is that the root of all evil in the world is money, that the Federal Reserve, the nation's central bank, was created for the sole benefit of its member banks after a stock panic in 1907. A secret meeting was held at a J.P. Morgan estate on Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia. It was there that the central banking bill called the Federal Reserve Act was written. This legislation was written by bankers, not lawmakers. Based here in lower Manhattan, the financial sector was just one of the three targets set in the sights of the first Zeitgeist movie. Since its release, it's caused quite a stir with several websites springing up in an attempt to debunk the film, which has proved to be no easy task. However, one academic expert who knows her way around conspiracy theories says the Zeitgeist movie may be nothing more than a little bit of bull. So I would say it's a grand uh, conspiracy theory linking three previous strands of conspiracy. Kathy Olmsted is a history professor at the University of California and has authored three books dealing with conspiracies and secrecy within the U.S. government. From her research, she defined conspiracy theories as simple ways to make sense of complicated circumstances and sees why the first movie has been such a powerful recruitment tool. Well, it would make the movie more authoritative if they didn't take these leaps from the undeniable to the unbelievable. But it also would make it less compelling. I mean, I think part of the reason that so many people have watched it and been taken in by it is because it is proposing this grand theory that explains everything. Olmsted's skepticism has been echoed on chat boards across the Internet. However, the Zeitgeist movement has continued to grow. The group has chapters in all 50 states and 49 countries around the world. Their message has taken root in countries as far away as Macedonia and Mongolia. We've been told that there are upwards of 500,000 people possibly following the movement, um, talking about upwards of millions of hits online on the movie. Historically, where does that fit in uh, in terms of the size of other movements? Well, if that's true, then it is uh, definitely the largest movement in history. I'm not sure, though, that it's true. I don't know if you can really measure the uh, numbers of adherence to this kind of movement. Despite the first movie's online success, the movement's members were quick to divorce themselves and the rest of the movement from the very film that started it all. Well, to be clear, the, um, the first film has nothing to do whatsoever with the Zeitgeist movement. Uh, it was a production by the creator Peter Joseph to express his point of view on specific topics. If the movie isn't the Bible for the Zeitgeist movement, the movie, by the same token, it's still posted on the website. It's still available for download. It's still called Very much the Zeitgeist. TZM. Yeah, it's exactly. still called the Zeitgeist yeah. movie. And it's still on our site. Yeah. <laughs> we don't go to the first film and, and really use what, it, what the first film says to do, to do advocacy work. Instead, the group relies on the ideas of this man, inventor and designer Jacques Fresco. 
He's the founder of the Venus Project, which he runs from a compound located in Venus, Florida. It was even apparent to Larry King back in 1974 that Fresco had some unique ideas. All right, let's, uh, with the uh, pictures, explore the thinking of Jacques Fresco and the society he'd like to see. Now, we'll start with this, and you tell me... I'll try to point it out. Yeah, you can point right at it. The center of the city, the nucleus, will house an electronic computer, which only controls the weather, water purification, the atmospheric conditions, the computers do not, I say it again, do not control people. I remember five years ago I used to laugh at you, and now all this is very believable. Now 95 years old, Fresco still spends his time designing his version of the future, as he's done for nearly seven decades. A vision filled with sustainable cities that harvest energy from renewable resources and high-end technology that improves human efficiency. Even though Fresco parted ways with the movement in April 2011, his idea of a resource-based economy was the focus of Peter Joseph's second film, Zeitgeist Addendum. Members of the movement say this was the key film that gave rise to the Zeitgeist movement. War, poverty, corruption, hunger, misery, human suffering will not change in a monetary system. Understanding this, we then see that money fundamentally exists as a barrier to these resources. The Venus Project proposes that technocrats using supercomputers, not politicians or religious leaders, would be in charge of controlling resources. But it left us wondering how we could live in a world without money. We asked Keith Embler, the group's New York State chapter coordinator. How do you motivate people in a resource-based economy? What makes someone say, I'm going to get up and contribute to society today instead of saying, well, we got the machines doing the, the hard work, I'm doing the easy, in fact, I've got nothing to do, I'm going to the beach. Um, a lot of people will do that, and that will add to our quality of life. Who doesn't love going to the beach? If this is beginning to sound whimsical for a handful of lucky zeitgeist activists, the line between the world as they see it today and the future they envision became blurred when they were invited to act as extras in Peter Joseph's third film, Zeitgeist Moving Forward. Another viewer attracted to an alternative to the monetary system was Jared Lochner, the young man who shot Arizona Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords. According to high school friends, Lochner became obsessed with the film. I really think that this Zeitgeist documentary had a profound impact upon Jared Lochner's mindset. The Zeitgeist movement is explicitly nonviolent, so um, for somebody to go and, and do something crazy like that, I I wouldn't hold the movement responsible at all. I wouldn't hold Peter Joseph or the films responsible for that person's actions at all. And neither would Lorenzo Segarra, the zeitgeister we met during our group interview. What surprised us about Segarra was his answer to our question about what he did for a living. I have a background in banking. I spent maybe my entire professional career in finance, whether broke terms, insurance, banking. And what might surprise you, Lorenzo Segarra is Mr. Kill Money. He's told us he's worked for New York Life Insurance, insurance giant AIG, and Capital One Bank. And it was actually there at Capital One that I made the transformation into Mr. Kill Money. Take me back to the banking days. Um, was there any, anything in particular that sticks out in your mind where you said, I've had enough of this, I need to make a change? About a year into, into my position there, and I looked at it as an opportunity. I said, well, what better place to warn people about the devil than at Hell's Gates. And so his alter ego, Mr. Killmoney, was born. For Sagara, Mr. Killmoney is a personified caricature of his old life, replete with three-piece banker suit and diamond dollar sign earrings. Mr. Killmoney preaches the zeitgeist gospel whenever he gets a chance. In the middle of our conversation, that message caught the ear of a passerby. The public, they don't see, they see what's going on there. Well, one thing we can see is that progress is being made. Yes, yeah, but we need a movie. Ah. Not a small movement, like a 60s movement. This young man from New Jersey preferred that we not identify him by name, but we quickly learned why he was drawn to Mr. Kilmoney's zeitgeist message. These, these are hard questions to, to ask, let alone answer. Um, but what's, what's been the biggest adjustment for you? Being treated like a um, piece of trash because I'm homeless. Within a matter of minutes, we witnessed the recruitment of a new member. Still without a place to live, he may have at least found a new home. A worldwide community based on one simple idea. We all need to kill money before money kills us. 
Epilepsy is a neurological disorder that affects nearly 3 million people in the United States and 50 million worldwide. It's caused by electrical discharges in the brain, which send signals throughout the nervous system. These signals can contrast in severity and lead to a variety of seizure types. While FDA-approved medications and other treatments have been known to help, still nearly one-third of all people with epilepsy continue to have uncontrolled seizures, severely limiting their overall quality of life. Some, however, are finding relief through a different form of medication, one that is controversial among doctors and lawmakers alike. When you're walking through Times Square and you have had a seizure, you think about the 15, 20,000 that are walking through there and just the catastrophe that would be caused. But when I used cannabis, it started blocking these thoughts out. Tim Dejao is 24 years old from Clifton, New Jersey. He has been suffering from epilepsy since he was diagnosed at age 10. So it sounds to me like the cannabis wasn't just seizure control, it was a release from this anxious feeling. It was. Instead of looking at it and saying, oh, he's having seizures, let's use something to block it, let's just use something to cancel out the effects of epilepsy, it was in fact removing this anxiety. Tim's anxiety is a result of 14 years of seizures. In an attempt to help control his epilepsy, he's been subject to numerous medications, each one with a variety of complications. I'd say with each medication, I was a different person. Each one came with different side effects. Some were easy bruising, some were hair loss, some were weight gain. And as they saw each one getting more and more severe, they had to continually transition. I'd say actually they went through probably about four drugs in one year. Do you know other people that have epilepsy that have been through a similar pattern? I've seen people who have had such severe seizures that they've had to wear helmets every day, that they cannot take them off. I've met other people that have about 120 seizures a day, and really you cannot talk to them. Four. Very good. And what is this letter? Stephen Nick is 14 years old. He was diagnosed with Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, a severe form of epilepsy, at age two. We sat down with his mother, Georgia, in Fullerton, California, to learn about his debilitating condition. He started having them when he was about one to one and a half. Um, he started with just little, you know, little jerks, and they progressed, and they went from little jerks to grand malls to absent seizures. Um, He's got every type. We've tried everything. He's 14. You okay? See, he's having some type of seizure. Yeah. 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 Some people wouldn't recognize that as a seizure, mm -hmm. what he just did. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, he's having them constantly during the day. Mm -hmm. No, a lot of times, even at his school, they'll tell me, oh, he had no seizures at all today. He did so good. And I'm thinking, I know Stephen. It's I been, know. it's just been a battle the whole time. And, <clears throat> It's just relentless. It never lets up. You know, we might try something and think, all right, you know, he's seizure free. He's been seizure free for two days and you count the days and then all of a sudden here comes another big one and you're back to square one. So it's, uh, it's frustrating. Yeah, it is. A third of patients with epilepsy are categorized as refractory, meaning they continue to have seizures despite numerous medications. Here in Washington, D.C., 10,000 individuals, just a small percentage of the epilepsy population in the U.S., participate in the National Walk for Epilepsy to raise awareness and money for research in the disorder, which has been historically underfunded. With all of our choices that we have today, unfortunately, the medications that we have haven't been proven to be more effective than those that we had several decades ago. Dr. Evan Fertig is Director of Research for Northeast Regional Epilepsy Group and the co-director of the Epilepsy Center of Excellence in Jersey City, New Jersey. There are still other treatments, uh, dietary therapies, uh, vagus nerve stimulation. Epilepsy surgery can be highly effective for many, many patients with epilepsy. For Tim Dejao, surgery was an option he was willing to try. In 2006, he underwent resective brain surgery, a procedure in which surgeons remove a section of the brain in which the seizures are believed to originate. I had surgery and it was kind of a trade-off. I was having about 20 seizures a month initially, but they were not too severe. 
However, after surgery, I had fewer, but they started getting very severe, and it was very questionable how much time I could spend alone outside of school, just walking to a store even. So the surgery actually had affected your quality of life in a negative way? Yes, definitely so. In fact, there had to be more watching over me because my seizures were so severe that I started hitting my head very hard against the ground, leaving rug burns all the time. It became quickly evident that I needed to have a second. Tim underwent a second brain surgery, excited this time for the change he was looking for. The outcome, however, was not what he expected. I woke up, and just like the first one, I couldn't really move. It took me about two weeks to get my left arm and my left leg functioning as normal, but I couldn't move my left hand at all. And I thought, well, I officially have lost functionality there. You must have been really scared when you woke up and... It was frustrating for certain. I had some hope, but, you know, as weeks passed, it went down and down. Tim did eventually regain the use of his hand. Still, his second surgery did not help the seizures. With his hope spoiled and his fear and anxiety at an all-time high, Tim left home to attend Colorado State University. There, he soon learned of the benefits of medical marijuana. Well, when I had initially got to Colorado, I had never thought, okay, medical marijuana, that's what I want. But I was ready to try something else. I had never done drugs, but I figured, okay, maybe it'll help. How can it hurt me at this point? When you were younger, when you were trying all these different medications, these different prescriptions, brain surgery had been recommended, did anyone ever mention medical marijuana to you as an alternative therapy? Not at all. I never thought about that as more than just a recreational drug. I never knew that it might have any sort of benefit. As a Schedule I narcotic, by definition, marijuana is said to have no medical benefit whatsoever, uh, no safe dosage, even under a doctor's supervision, um, and it's supposed to have a high potential for addiction. Greg Campbell is a journalist and author of the book Pot, Inc., a first-hand look at the marijuana industry, its medical benefits, and state and federal legislation. The Controlled Substances Act divided drugs from in Schedules 1 through 5. Doctors are banned uh, by law from prescribing a Schedule 1 narcotic. So that's why you see in medically permissive states uh, the doctors recommend marijuana. It was this type of recommendation that allowed Tim DeJao to make his first ever purchase of medical marijuana. You, at this point, had been prescribed the medical marijuana for the first time. Tell me how, how you saw some improvement in your seizures. It was just absolutely amazing. The effect just turned around my life. I realized, wow, I don't have to be bound to my apartment anymore. I can go out there. I can shake hands. I can get a job. I can live a normal, regular life. In the first semester, I got a 3.6. I was working. I was interning. I was the Tim DeJow I had always wanted to be. With the use of medical marijuana, Tim's seizure count dropped from an average of 20 a month to less than one. Despite his remarkable progress, some neurologists are still hesitant to prescribe the drug. These are anecdotal reports, and what may have happened to one patient doesn't necessarily extend to, to another. You know, marijuana is it's not just one one chemical entity, it's, it's, it's hundreds. You know, I think until we have, you know, clear federal go-ahead to prescribe, I, I, I wouldn't. The particular active chemicals in marijuana which are believed to be beneficial for patients are tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC, and cannabidol, or CBD. THC has psychoactive effects and has been used to treat nausea in chemotherapy patients and reduce intraocular pressure in people suffering with glaucoma. CBD has anti-inflammatory properties and has been known to reduce chronic pain, arthritis, and seizures. By extracting these chemicals, medical marijuana dispensaries can now provide more options to their patients than the standard smoked form. Products now range from baked goods and drinks to lozenges and a droplet form known as a tincture. A tincture is much better because you can put it under your tongue and you can go right outside. There's no sensation at all. It's almost like taking Tylenol. You really don't feel anything, but the headache goes away. Despite these new developments and medical marijuana's current legalization in 16 states, federal law and the stigma that comes with 80 years of illegal activity, 
continues to create difficulty for patients like Tim DeJao. I was on day 96 of no seizures, and my parents had said, well, let's fly out from New Jersey. We can be there on day 100. It'll be exciting. Days before this momentous occasion, however, Tim's landlord discovered marijuana in his apartment. Concerned about legal action, he left him a note threatening eviction. Despite his right to possess under Colorado state law, the fear of losing his home drove Tim to quickly dispose of all traces of his medication. Two days later, I was walking and I fell and I had the seizure and I could just feel myself raking my face against the concrete. That seizure was so severe that I woke up with my face completely torn off. There was so much bleeding, so many cuts. Like all anti-epileptic medications, sudden withdrawals can lead to additional seizures. Tim was rushed to the hospital and treated for his injuries. The truth of the matter wasn't even the fact that my face was bleeding so much. It was that I just almost made it to day 100 and I never have again ever since I've never been able to make it that far. So what do you do now? How, how do you get the marijuana? I don't even use it. Honestly, I've just pretty much backed off of it because I feel like, you know what, it's not worth being judged. And so I have more seizures again. I've had to experiment with new medications. It's come with new side effects. And so I'm just on a lull period of it's not worth it. This frustration Tim feels is a common thread that binds many people with epilepsy. For George and Nick, 14 years of frustration has brought her to the point of considering a medical marijuana prescription for her son, Stephen. I had faith in all the medications and all the drugs and all the surgeries, and um, now I'm down to, I have no, not many more options left with him. So that's where I'm at now is why not? And when I do try it on, I'm just going to watch them closely and, you know, as with any other medication and see how it goes. You know, it's, uh, like I said, if it, I would try anything if it would help my son. I think it's very important um, for patients who are considering this that they first discuss it with their neurologist. And, you know, marijuana has been available for centuries and used medically for centuries and it probably is. Uh, effective for some things, but you know and that doesn't necessarily extend into something that a physician could, could prescribe right. without more study. The problem here is that because of the Schedule One that's still looming over marijuana, the ability to freely study uh, these ingredients, these cannabinoids that have all this unlocked potential, is really in the in the infant stage. And once you cross that line from Schedule 1 into Schedule 2, the drug is said to have some medicinal value to it. And it allows doctors to prescribe it and pharmacies to distribute it. And it also opens the doors to more robust medical research. It would cost tens of millions of dollars in research and testing for marijuana to meet the Food and Drug Administration's approval. And for pharmaceutical companies to invest that type of funding, a major change in federal marijuana legislation would have to occur. Without testing, however, the laws are unlikely to change. This decades-long staring contest leaves epilepsy patients hanging in limbo, just waiting for one side to blink, hoping for one more option, and praying for a day without seizures. Honestly, I have seen no better thing than cannabis for myself. I have seen other epileptics try it, and just like any medication, they have not had success. Once I have legalization from the state, I will use it again because I have seen more beneficial effects in myself than any other medication I've taken. It hasn't just improved epilepsy, it's improved Tim the Jow. I'm someone that's never been stronger. New York City, a main character in countless books and films that boast classic landmarks, oddities of every variety, and everything in between, is naturally one of the world's top tourist destinations. While the nation faced a financial crisis, tourism softened the blow to the Big Apple. In 2010, New York City attracted 48.7 million domestic and international tourists. With these numbers, there's no denying that tourism is an essential part of the city's economy. 
But even though tourism is integral to New York's economy, it is more than just dollars and cents. When we learned of an anti-competitive practice between two major tour companies, we decided to peek into the inner workings of the industry. And beneath the glossy veneer of Times Square, we found that some tour companies may be taking tourists for a ride. Times Square is a dazzling neon tourist magnet, and it's easy to see why. Just take a quick stroll down Broadway. The aroma of roasting food wafts through the air, while street vendors hawk everything from I Heart New York shirts to passes for late night comedy shows and the hottest Broadway acts. And the flashing, glittering signs on every corner mean Times Square is bright as day, even at midnight. We talked to tourists in Times Square to find out what brought them to New York City. You know, all the excitement is right here, pretty much. And, like, where we are, there's no really, like, sidewalks and a bunch of stores where you can walk around. So we come here when we want excitement. <laughs> um, yeah, we're going to go see Adam's family, which is really exciting. James Musig, a licensed tour guide with the Gray Line Double Decker Bus Tour Company, believes tourism has become one of the anchors of New York's economy. We're approaching 50 million visitors a year. I can't think of any other place in the world that is such a magnet for visitors. Long ago, we surpassed uh, Disney World. And during the recession, when financial services, which is our historic backbone, tanked and everyone was getting laid off, it was tourism that stayed steady, that kept us going. According to the Bloomberg administration, the industry employed more New Yorkers in 2010 than ever before. And the $31 billion visitors spent last year supported our restaurants, shops, hotels, and cultural institutions. On top of that, tourism adds about $8 billion in tax revenue to the city's coffers. Tourism professionals estimate that without the economic impact of tourism, each New York City household would pay an additional $1,200 more in taxes every year. However, some in the industry think it is short-sighted to ignore the non-monetary benefits tourism brings to the city. Moses Gates is an urban planner, demographer, and licensed tour guide. And for Gates, guiding is about sharing the New York experience. So from your perspective, how important is the tourism industry to New York City in terms of not just revenue, but other non-monetary benefits? I think the, the non-monetary benefits are the big one. I think a lot of times tourists are taken and the tourism industry is taken only as a revenue generator. And I think that's a big mistake. And I think once you start to treat tourists as only, you know, these people whose purpose is to spend as much money as they can in the city, I think you really lose a lot. And you lose a lot of pride in your city. Andy Sidor, now an independent tour guide and formerly with Gray Line Bus Company, has worked in New York's tourism sector for 12 years. The city loves tourists to come, but it's like the old New Yorker cartoon, you know, welcome to New York, now get the hell out. I, I think some people still have a fantasy we can fly them into JFK, have them pour the money into a bucket and fly them right out again, and that's not going to work. One industry that thrives from those millions of tourists is the tour bus industry, particularly hop-on, hop-off buses. Anyone who has ever set foot in New York City has seen a red Gray Line bus or a blue City Sites bus making its way about Manhattan, showing visitors sites like the Flatiron Building, Museum Mile, and the Empire State Building. Why did you decide to take the bus instead of wandering around on your own? Uh, Manhattan is very, very big, and we decided that we, we're not going to be walking all over Manhattan, so it was an easy way to actually uh, go to different places. Now, as to the hop-on, hop-off, double-decker buses, do you think they're generally a good value for tourists? The double-decker uh, buses, I think, are a great value. It is a quasi-transportation network but it's geared towards what tourists are interested in. We do take you to the places that you already decided you wanted to go before you came to New York. You know, before Double Deckers came along, um, it was a much lower energy uh, tourism business. And frankly, I think they were just failing to tap into a lot of tourists who weren't planning ahead. When they went to these street sellers, they found the number of tickets they sold double, triple, quadruple. You know, they, they really sold money they never even dreamed it was possible to make before. Uh, it really be, has been this huge gold mine, and it didn't exist before the 1990s. At first glance, city sites in Gray Line appear to be competing for tourist dollars, but closer inspection reveals very little difference between the two. Uh, with the Gray Line, this one is 88 in two days. I can show you a little different for the downtown. 
I would say my downtown is much, much better. Because and they offer the same basic tour packages at the same prices, $42 to $86 per person for one to three day tickets. Everything is the same. Oh. We operate in the same office, everything is the same. It's owned by the same people. Gray Line and City Sites actually operate under the same joint venture, Twin America. About six years ago, a competitor came on the scene uh, called City Sites, and they were competing very strongly against the uh, Gray Line brands in New York. Uh, City Sites grew exponentially from six to over 70 buses in very few years. I think that competition was good for the customer. I can remember uh, specifically the tour guides in Times Square. It's late at night, we're exhausted. And we're like, let's just go home, let's go home. And we'd have a manager on the street screaming, as long as those blue buses are giving tours on the street, we're gonna stay here in Times Square giving tours on the street. Eventually, Stagecoach and City Sites decided that they didn't wanna compete against each other anymore. What kind of impact do you think that's had on Tourism. I think tourism. it's a horrible impact. I think the first thing that happened after the merger is they raised their prices. Um, you know, it's not how America works. America wants competition. It wants, you know, dynamic capitalism. It doesn't want one giant company uh, doing everything. You know, you have people that uh, have the red brochures and the people that have the blue brochures, and these customers actually think they have a choice. This is a totally false choice. All the money's going in the same pot. The riding public is being misled. Uh, in thinking that there's a fair competition here. It's um, totally set up uh, like a casino against the player. The house always wins. We're here in front of the offices of the New York State Attorney General, which launched an antitrust investigation into the Twin America merger after city sites raised its prices to match those of Gray Lines. In an effort to escape the jurisdiction of the Attorney General's office, Twin America sought approval from the Surface Transportation Board, a federal regulatory agency. Commissioners, um, my name is James Yoon. I'm an assistant attorney general from the Antitrust Bureau of the New York State Attorney General's Office. The uh, joint venture by the applicants is um, harms competition, harms employees. And we In his testimony before the STB, argued that the STB should deny Twin America's application. Not in the public interest. But rather than rubber stamp the joint venture, the STB concluded the merger did constitute an anti-competitive practice and ordered Twin America to break up its monopoly. Twin America is currently appealing the decision and was recently granted a stay of the order. So how long do you think it will be before the Twin America monopoly is finally dismantled. So if they want to keep this going and they're willing to spend over a million dollars a year in legal fees, which it pays them to do, they could probably drag this out another five, six years. So it could go on for quite some time. They might be a little more cautious in the raising of the ticket price while the <laughs> appeals are going on, though. This might be good for the customers. We reached out to Gray Line, City Sites, and Twin America for their take on this matter, but not one single representative responded to our repeated request for an interview. Twin America and many tour businesses put their bottom line ahead of the tourists. The tourism industry, to some extent, is all about taking a tourist and hanging them upside down and rattling their pockets until the ch all the change falls out. And it's not the greatest way to, to build business or to get goodwill in the city, I think. I'm Beth Foster. Thanks for watching this special Brooklyn College edition of 60 Minutes.